My name is uh, William, and I'm a software engineer at Facebook. And uh, today in this short talk, I'm going to be giving a presentation on container security at Facebook and uh, a particular system that we built to uh, handle a particular uh, class of container security problems. So just really quickly on the agenda, we're going to uh, start off talking about containers at Facebook, what makes containers at Facebook versus some you may have encountered elsewhere, uh, talk about container security uh, in general, and then Kapmandi and uh, the problems that it solves in our container environments, and then how we're leveraging Kapmandi to build tight sandboxes. All right, so uh, what exactly is a container at Facebook? Well, to start off, uh, each container gets its own view of the file system, and it runs in its own, own C group. And uh, to do that, we leverage standard technology, standard namespaces like C group, uh, mount, PID. Um, we use C group v2. And uh, we actually run a full init system within the container, uh, which allows us to do uh, things like running SSHD, rsyslog, cron, all inside the container. And that makes our containers very powerful and capable and self-contained. Um, but it also requires that our containers have a certain amount of privilege. Um, so this contra in, in contrast to some of the things we don't use, we don't use uh, user namespaces or network namespaces, um, although we do actually have our own homegrown ways of uh, doing network isolation. Um, but just keep this in mind later on, because this might come into play for some of the uh, security issues that we might talk about. All right, so let's uh, quickly get context on container security and issues that can uh, arise. Uh, so what could go wrong if we have a container running on a host and it's got root privilege? Um, so in this particular case, we have a dev that's bi uh, read-only bind mounted from the host in the container. Um, what could the container do to subvert this? Well, one thing is it could just remount that, uh, that device and change something in the container, and then now we've basically borked the host. Um, so let's do one more example, something much more nefarious in this case. Uh, so again, we have a container running as root in the host. And uh, what if it installs a kernel module? Uh, what can we do now? Well, we can do all kinds of interesting things. So maybe it uh, breaks out of the container by, uh, or do it does something like uh, NS enters into the root namespace, uh, and then installs some malicious cron job. And then now later on, it you know, it gets removed, some other container is running, and now it's basically monitoring this container. Um, so I think I've belabored, belabored the point there. Uh, the issue is that you don't want containers to run as root in general. Uh, you want something a little bit more uh, tightly grained. So uh, there are two broad security models uh, to, uh, to handle this. One of them is basically don't run as root, and the other one is using Linux capabilities. So don't run as root is simple enough. Uh, basically, you just don't let any processes run as root. And uh, it's simple. And in theory, it's safe. Uh, but of course, at Facebook, it's completely untenable. Um, and there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, for one, you know, there are just too many uh, privileged things that we might need to do inside of our containers, uh, like set a UID or you know, bind to a reserved port, um, change file permissions, file ownership. All of these things require root privilege. So what you'll end up having is basically containers all running as root, and that's bad. So this brings us to the next security model, which is Linux capabilities. And as you may know, Linux capabilities are basically just a way to break up root into a bunch of privileged operations. And then you can uh, assign those privileged operations or remove them on a per process basis. And this is great. It's much better than the alternative, of course. But it also has its own issues. Uh, for one, it's, you know, it requires a lot more work to use effectively. So uh, luckily, we actually have ways of leveraging ca uh, Linux capabilities on all of the modern container engines, NSpawn, Rocket, Systemd. They all have ways of setting capabilities. And that's great. But there are still issues even with this, because you don't really know which capabilities to assign. Um, so how do you solve that problem? Uh, you might just say, well, let me just kind of introspect the code and like see what's going on. Unfortunately, again, at Facebook, that's completely untenable. Um, for one, we run a bunch of third-party libraries. Um, we've got internal tools. We even have custom uh, executable formats. Um, so we can't do that. Uh, another option might be to uh, just look at the most uh, nefarious offenders, like Capsys Admin. That's basically root privilege. Uh, CapNet Admin, which basically says, you can do whatever you want to the network. Um, but 
even these actually have you know, legitimate use cases in containers, so we can't just set one hard and fast rule and remove those. Um, so basically what I'm getting at here is that we really need some way of knowing exactly which capabilities a container needs so that we can give them those and then we can just remove everything else. And so uh, to do this, we actually built our own system known as Kapmandi. And uh, Kapmandi is a logging daemon. It monitors uh, Linux capability usage and it resolves it to the container associated with that usage. Um, some of the technologies that it leverages is C groups v2, uh, BPF, and extended attributes. And we're currently working on open sourcing this. So I just quickly want to get on the same page because we're going to have a discussion on how Kapmandi does what it does. Um, but let's first just quickly get on the same page with regard to all the technologies that it leverages. So um, C groups um, basically are a way to bundle processes. Or, or, I'm sorry, bundle processes into some grouping. Um, it's hierarchical, and um, you know, with those groupings, then you can uh, set resource uh, resource minim minimums, maximums, these kinds of things. And notably here, important for uh, our discussion, is that basically we have a corresponding file hierarchy for this C group hierarchy, and you configure the C group by basically writing to that file system underneath the hood. Um, BPF. So BPF is basically a way to decorate a kernel function with a script that you can tell uh, the kernel to run before or after. It actually runs in kernel space and in a sandboxed environment, which is really great for security. Um, and then it also has ways to export data from kernel space to user space. And finally, extended attributes are basically just a way to attach metadata to a file. Um, and the reason this is useful for us is because um, it, you know, it'll persist a little bit longer than like the lifetime of a process, for example. So if you're monitoring capabilities for a process that, you know, comes alive, uses capability, and dies really quickly, you don't want something as ephemeral as just looking at the process and then trying to do some resolution. All right. So now that we've set the stage there, we're going to go into this toy example, basically, of how Katmandi does what it does. And uh, we're going to illustrate that through this uh, systemd service file. So we have a service here. Uh, we're actually going to start it using systemd end spawn. And uh, this is a service file. What's most notable here is that we're going to run it in this slice, which basically is a way for us to specify to systemd the C group that we want that container to run into inside of. So at some point, you uh, instantiate your service, and there it is running on the host. And uh, systemd is going to take that slice and uh, luckily for us, it's going to uh, tag this extended attribute on the C group that you specified for uh, the container. So some point later on, uh, your container uses some capability. So in this case, cap McNod. And uh, there it is, cap, cap Mandy comes alive in the kernel. It collects a bunch of metadata, so the capability that was used, the inode, uh, the inode number. So these two may seem completely mysterious, but we're actually going to be using this so that we can do this container resolution later. Um, then it exports that to user space using BPF. And then we take this metadata, notably the inode and the inode number, and we're basically going to crawl down sysfsc group looking for a match. Now once we found that, we can just read the extended attribute that was set by systemd. And uh, then there's a final step where we do some kind of resolution from that UUID to the container that it associates with. So in the case of nspawn, we can use a dbus API and basically tell systemd to give us the unit name. So lastly, what can we do with this metadata? Well, one thing that we're doing at Facebook is we're leveraging it to build uh, automated capability management systems. So we take that data, we, you know, cache it locally for performance reasons, we send it to remote storage, and then on some subsequent invocation of the uh, container, we're going to pull from remote storage and uh, put those capabilities inside the spec, and then we're going to drop all other capabilities. All right, so um, that's basically how it works. Let's just quickly talk about the performance characteristics. Um, so we've got several uh, layers of caching uh, that make Kathmandu very performant. Uh, so first, let's just talk about kind of the, the, the things that give rise to this really good uh, caching uh, characteristics. So for one, processes tend to behave similarly across different invocations, which basically means that they're going to use the same capabilities uh, pretty predictably. Um, and with that, we can basically cache uh, 
uh, a number of things. So in kernel space, we can cache uh, the process. Um, and basically, that allows us to only export to user space when we really need to. So most of the time, it just runs in the kernel and uh, pretty much goes back to sleep. Um, also, uh, we have another layer of caching inside uh, user space, where we're caching the uh, mapping from uh, the, the capability that was used to the container name, so we don't have to keep doing this crawling SysFSC group thing, and that helps us keep our I.O. down. And then we actually have one more layer of caching in user space, and this is specifically because um, we have asynchronous workloads, for example, that do a bunch of forking, and then we have a bunch of unique PIDs, so caching by PID doesn't really work um, in those types of workloads. So in this case, we would, not, we would want to cache by this other metadata, like the inode and the inode number. And that keeps our network usage pretty, uh, pretty low. Um, and this gives rise to some really good performance characteristics. So uh, we get all this for about 50 megabytes of RSS memory. And uh, that's mainly due to the fact that there aren't that many capabilities. There are only like 30 some odd of them. Um, and it's running on every single host, so there aren't that many permutations uh, to cache. And then in terms of CPU, network, and I.O., that's all very low. Um, so it's, just, it's really great. Um, so let's quickly talk about how we're leveraging Kapmand to build stuff. So I already alluded in the previous slides that uh, we're building automated capability management systems, uh, which work in the way that I illustrated earlier. We're also doing something very similar to our CI CD workers. Um, and then we're also building detection infrastructure. So the main issue here is that we don't want uh, containers to be using Capsys Admin, for example, um, just willy-nilly. We really want to know why they're using Capsys Admin. So basically, when, uh, at some point, when we see a container using Capsys Admin, we'll have an audit uh, process that they'll have to go through where we ensure that they're not doing anything that they shouldn't be doing with that capability. And lastly, we're actually... Um, figuring out ways to leverage this to optimize our exec call monitoring, which already exists at Facebook. Um, but we found that we could probably do it uh, much better in terms of performance using Kapmandi. All right, and that's the end of my very short talk. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll be, oh, we have a question. Or is that a stretch? So, uh, a couple of things. One, um, what happens when the container actually asks for a capability that you blocked, are you at least logging the fact you know, that you, your CI CD system didn't find all the capabilities that it, it could potentially use? Right. And so we're basically mitigating that by just ensuring that we've monitored for a sufficiently long, uh, large window. So specifically something like 30 days should be sufficient. Uh, we'd imagine that after 30 days you've hit all of the edge cases that that uh, process or container might have hit. And um, in the case where we actually don't catch something, um, basically in our, uh, in our rollout systems, we're doing this kind of in a two-phase uh, process. So in the first phase, we won't necessarily like, let the process break or you know, assign these specific capabilities and strip everything else. Um, we could do something more like see if we got it right. And uh, also the other thing is um, a lot of our uh, containers have multiple instances. So we might have a job that has you know, thousands of tasks, for example. We don't have to do this capability stripping for every single task. We can do it for some subset, see if they break. If it's safe, then we can roll it out further. OK, second question. Um, sometimes an application will attempt to do something, get permission denied, and then we'll go on and do a more safe thing afterwards. Um, so if, if your monitor find, basically finds the first capability it asks for, and you allow it, um, do you sometimes just say, try to run it without the capability and see if it would continue to work? I uh, drop all capabilities and actually see if it, it works. Um, so if it, used, if it does some privileged operation, and uh, you know, this is during the monitoring phase, so we've said, OK, you need this capability, then basically that wouldn't get dropped from the set. But the, you bring up a good point. You know, it could be the case that maybe they can do that um, or maybe they can get denied and then do something safer. Uh, that's not something that we've really looked into so far. Right now, we're just saying, okay, if you need this capability, then we'll give you this capability. Is, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. And I'm out of time, unfortunately. But uh, thank you very much. <laughs>